We're continuing today in the Gospel of Mark. We'll be in Mark chapter 9, second half of Mark chapter 9. Uh, today's title is The God of the Impossible. That's who we uh, serve, that's who we worship. He's the God who's in control of all things. And so uh, to, to get into the main aspect of this verse, again, as usual, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, but I will share, share this right at the beginning. Uh, this passage is going to open up so many cans of worms this morning that I'm not going to be able to answer all in just one service. That I, I just, I'm thankful that tonight is last Sunday seminary at 5 o'clock because I, there's going to be a lot of stuff you think, well, what did he mean by that? And I'm not going to be able to answer it this morning. Some of it I will, but uh, if you can come back out this evening and ask questions, love for you to do that. Okay? Uh, this is where we, we're back in the spring of 32 A.D., uh, this is six months before the transfiguration that we learned about last week. Just go back and do a little background. Jesus called the 12 apostles together to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Okay, that, that's another word for demons. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So Jesus gave them his authority, his supernatural ability over the supernatural world, uh, demons and sickness. Uh, they're healing them there, the disciples are. Uh, and then later, after it tells about that passage and the ministry that they went out and did, the apostles returned to Jesus and they told him all that they had done and taught. So key thing, we talked about this last week. The miracles they did were a precursor to authenticity authenticate the message that they taught. Do you see that? That's why we only see supernatural miracles in three major periods throughout history is because there's only been three major periods throughout history in which God's word has been delivered. It's not something that has happened over time through uh, various places throughout the world. It, that constantly, over time, God's not still speaking holy writ today, okay? And the majority of human history, vast majority, 99.99% of human history, God isn't speaking holy writ, okay? But in these special times, he authenticates the message that he's giving by miracles. And that's what the disciples are doing there. And so they come back and they tell Jesus, like, this is unbelievable. All this stuff we've been seeing you do for the last two years, we were doing it. And Jesus, man, that's great, man. I'm just so proud of you guys. And so time went on. They went and did a mission trip after that to uh, foreign lands all around to the Decapolis eventually. Um, but before I go further, because we're going to see another story about Jesus casting out a demon. It's the last one we're going to see here in the book of Mark. Um, I'm going to answer this question, and we should be asking it. Why don't we see so much demonic activity today? Okay. You, just page after page, to this point, like five or six chapters have mentioned a story about Jesus casting out demons or the disciples casting out demons. So uh, we should look at this like, man, why were there so many demons around back then and they're not today? Well, I'm going to submit to you this day that there are. That we do see demonic presence. And so what I want to do is kind of open our eyes together about how demonic activity works in our culture so you can recognize it just the way the disciples recognized it in their culture. Here's the first thing you have to understand about demonic activity, okay? Demons infiltrate what a society values, okay? And if you look at what our society values... And, and examine that, you'll see the work of demonic activity behind that, okay? So let's start out in biblical times, okay? Uh, what kind of society did they have? An agrarian culture, okay? And they didn't have social security. They didn't have disability benefits back then. Your entire livelihood was based upon your ability to do what? Work, physically work, okay? And if you couldn't physically work, then you weren't able to eat, Provide for your family. And so this was the thing that they valued most, the people who could just work the hardest. Almost like slave labor back in the days. Like who could do the most with their body to earn the most income. And so this is what they valued. Therefore, since that's what they valued, the majority of the healings that took place had to do with sickness that kept people from being able to work physically. Does that make sense? Demons are going to attack or infiltrate 
that which a society values most. And in this case, it was hard work, okay? Uh, but you know what the number one religion in the world is that most societies value? Uh, this is a picture of a, of a stage or an altar area. Um, number one place of worship in the world, kind of worship in the world, is ancestor worship. We, we see a little bit of it here in the United States. You ever heard it say, man, I'm going to throw up a prayer to Grandma. Grandma, hey, if you could help me here. Sometimes people are serious about that. Sometimes not so much. Praying to someone that went on. Praying to a human being in their family line. Like, hey, will you, can you please watch over me here? We say it when we say things like, hey, Grandma's watching over us. My Uncle Bobby was a preacher. I'm sure he's still watching. I mean, we say it that way. But a lot of the world believes that as the major thing that they worship. And so they pray to these. And so what demons do is they infiltrate this area and they falsely appear or give dreams to people because spiritual warfare is mental warfare. Give dreams to people that have to do with their ancestors who have passed away. And that's what they worship. Okay, uh, The big thing that we worship here in our society is science. And reasoning. We are people who just pride ourselves in being able to figure things out into academics. So watch this, watch this. If this is what our culture values, the demons aren't going to infiltrate other areas as much as this one. What do I mean by that? In the worlds of science and reasoning, Satan's will uh, Satan will attack us through attacking our understanding of the natural world. Not the supernatural world. I'll say that again. Satan will attack us through our understanding of the natural world as opposed to the supernatural world because we as a society don't value the supernatural. In fact, we don't even believe in it. So Satan is going to take what we believe in and pervert that. He's going to give blinders to people so that they cannot see the handiwork of the creator and attribute it to the creator himself. So they will find all these other ways to explain how the world got here apart from the God who gave us this world so we could recognize his goodness and worship him for his power. Does that make sense? This is what we value. And what the devil will do is he will use supposed evidence from the universe to try to prove to these blind people that God does not exist. He would try to argue through reasoning and through higher education that there is no God. Or if there were, we could never understand him. The Apostle Paul talks about this to the Corinthian people, this idea of reason. Uh, Corinth is just in the backyard, uh, backyard of Athens, the number one thinking place in the world, the number one place of reason in the world. And so when Paul goes into Corinth, you don't see all these supernatural miracles. You see him arguing what? Reason, because that's what these people value. He says to them, we, though we walk in the flesh, okay, we are not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, I'm not going to argue the supernatural in the physical realm. I'm going to talk to you now about the supernatural in the, in the realm of reason. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. This is really important for us to understand. Our arguments that we have, not of the flesh, but in the mental realm, in the spiritual realm, have divine power. This word for divine is, is the idea of supernatural. The supernatural understanding of the natural. They have this power to destroy strongholds. What are these strongholds? Well, he explains it in verse 5. These, stronghold that, these strongholds that need to be destroyed are arguments. Now, an argument is not a physical thing. It's a mental thing, an idea of reason. So this is what Paul says. The way we're going to attack the devil and the way that he is attacking the Corinthians is we're going to go after that which they value. And we're going to argue and reason our way toward the gospel versus proving through supernatural physical miracles toward the gospel. 
So an argument is is an aspect of reason and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God to take captive every thought to obey Christ. Uh, Just so there's no misunderstanding here, look at the mental aspects of what he says spiritual warfare is in this society. It's based on arguments, opinions, knowledge, and thoughts. All four mental aspects of this is the spiritual realm where demons attack by establishing strongholds. That This is what we see in our education system. How can we establish an education system that leaves God out of that system? In fact, precludes God from that system. If the foundation of all of our knowledge comes from heaven above and you remove heaven above from our knowledge, then our basic understanding of all knowledge will be skewed. Do do y'all get what I'm saying there? It's so important for us to understand that the foundation of all knowledge is the creator of all knowledge. Another area in which people trust today is the area of government. And depending on your idea of government or your value of government, The more you value it, the more you want government to be involved in your life or to rule over your life. Uh, The more you move towards socialism and communism, the more it shows that you value government, a stronger hand of government. And people and societies that love government and want more government control, then the devil is going to get involved in those areas and in those societies. We see this in the book of Daniel. Okay, there's more examples I could give, but I'm just going to go here this morning. It says, an angel appears to Daniel. We know it's an angel from earlier in the, in the vision, okay? Daniel chapter 10. It says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, this prince that he's talking about, we learned earlier, is an angel, okay? There's this hierarchy between, in the demonic realm. He says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that's modern day Iran, okay, Prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, this angel, for 21 days. So he's speaking to Daniel, and he says, you prayed three weeks ago. I wanted to bring you the answer to your prayer, but I was fighting with the prince, the angel who oversees the area which is now modern-day Iran, modern-day Persia. And we were fighting back and forth, and I had an answer to you. I had this vision that I was going to bring to you from God, but we were having this spiritual fight between me and this demon. But Michael, now who is Michael? One of the chief princes. This is the archangel who oversees the people of Israel, okay? Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the higher ranking angels, came to help me for I was left there with the king's plural of Persia. This is another word for ruler. So what this angel is saying, I went in and I was fighting with the prince and all of a sudden the kings, the higher ranking angels show up and they started precluding me from bringing you the, the answer to your prayer. And so I just called on the general of all of us angels. I called on the archangel Michael to come down here and give me some help. And that is why now I've been able to come to you. He said, do you know why I've come? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So he's making a prophecy here is, look, the government of Persia is ruling right now. There's this battle in the spiritual realm that's happening. But when we defeat the princes of Persia, there's going to be another nation rise up under demonic influence. And that's going to be the kingdom of what? Greece, and if you look at the history, this is what's amazing about Daniel we'll talk about tonight. He's predicting the rise of Philip II and Alexander the Great some two, three hundred years before they actually come. But he says the next great kingdom on earth is going to be the kingdom of Greece, and they're going to come and conquer the Middle East. And at the time that he said this to Daniel, Greece was nothing. That would be like me saying to you today, someday Uruguay is going to take over the United States. And you'd be like, Uruguay? Like, most of you can't even tell me what continent that it's on, right? Because it's nothing. And that's the way Greece was back in the time. But the angel said, I'm just telling you, this is what's going to happen. Because in the spiritual realm, angels can see things coming long before we can. Okay? So if you value government, a society that values government, watch. The angels get involved. The demons get involved. They infiltrate that area. And so there's this batter in the realm of governance. And let me tell you right now, if you can't see 
that there is demonic activity going on in the government of the United States of America right now, my friends, you are blind to spiritual warfare. We are in an all-out fight for righteousness. But let me tell you what, government is not the answer. If you value government, you're going to go in where the demons are fighting. There's something higher than that, something more important than that that we should value, okay? Another place where demons infiltrate is in the area of religion. People who say, man, the problem with our nation is we need better morals. And so the demons are just fine with people following the rules of Christianity as long as they don't know the Christ of Christianity. The Pharisees were just fine with people knowing the rules of Judaism without knowing the God of Judaism. And so what the demons will come in and do is just communicate people, follow these rules, follow these rules, follow these rules. This will make you righteous. This will make you righteous. Knowing that just following rules will send you straight to hell. So they infiltrate religious orders. And let me tell you what, this is something that I've seen as a pastor. I almost hate to say this, but I just, this is something I've discovered over the years. Without question, the people that I see that do the most damage to the kingdom of God on earth are pastors. So-called men of God, so-called women of God who take to the pulpit and preach things other than the word of God, who will come right out and tell you, you don't need to do what God says anymore because we've got this figured out now our way. False prophets have always been a part of religious institutions. They just, let me tell you what, men who love control and power just find their way to pulpits. The people have hurt me the most in life, who have fought me, sharing the word of God with others the most, have been pastors. It's a dangerous place to be, religion is. Jesus recognizes that at the time and He says to the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the priests, the political leaders of the day, he speaks to them. He says, hey, you guys, you are of your father, the devil. They were like, we're children of Abraham. And he says, no, I'll tell you who you're children of, Satan himself. It's like a bad old Saturday night live skit. You know what I mean? It's like, who could it be? Satan? All right. He says, your will is to do your father's desires. Now, this what? Watch. These guys followed every biblical rule to the T. They were the best rule followers around. He says, when you follow God's law for your purposes, I'm just telling you, your will is to do your father's desires. In other words, you're using the law to gain public favor. It's not about personal righteousness. It's about control in a society. A lot of times people say, well, we're all children of God. Well, that's not what Jesus says here. These men are wicked. Their father is the devil. They want to do the will of the devil. They're pastors. Says of the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It's like they say, uh, how do you know when the devil's lying? You know the answer to that? When his lips are moving, right? He's always a liar, always will be. The Apostle Paul warns of these false pastors in the future years to come. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Who are these? It's pastors he's he's referring to. In 1 John, Apostle John says the same thing. He says, we as pastors are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He, and what he's saying is they had these pastors coming in into their churches, so-called pastors coming in, and they're saying, man, don't listen to what Paul teaches. Don't follow the example of the early church. Don't listen to Peter. Don't listen to me. We have the right understanding of the gospel that's a little bit different than what you'll see in the New Testament scriptures. And this is what he says, man, this is, this is why we have to recognize spiritual warfare when that happens. This is how we know who has the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
is those who agree with the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament are those who have the spirit of truth. And those who say you don't need to follow what the Bible says are those who have the spirit of error. There was a survey taken of uh, graduates of Perkins Theological Seminary. This is a seminary at Duke University 20 years ago. 20 years ago. It's not a modern one. 20 years ago. And they asked pastors who graduated, seminarians, as they were graduating from the Divinity School there at Duke, how many of them believed that in order to get to heaven, the only way was to believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. The only way to heaven for an adult to find their way to heaven is to believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. That Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, only 10% of the pastors who graduated from that class actually believed that. Flooding into Methodist churches and other denominations because it's a Methodist seminary. And people graduating like, man, they got a degree from Duke. They must really know what they're doing. And 90% of them don't believe that you have to believe in the physical resurrection of Christ from the dead. These are false teachers and they have infiltrated through demonic activity our seminaries in the United States. And they're sending out pastors throughout the world. And so I warn you here today that not all pastors are the same. How do you know the difference between a demonic pastor, one who follows the father of lies, and a godly pastor who follows that of the truth? Do they stick to the teaching of God's word? And if they contradict it, Watch out. Watch out. That's a sign of demons being involved. Okay? Now, mention all these groups. We're going to see two today. One, religious leaders, and also those who value physical healing. Okay? Uh, we left off last week with Jesus appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter, James, and John seeing that. Jesus comes back and touches them. God says, this is my Son in whom I listen to him, right? They're making their way down the mountain. That's what we see, okay? They just had the greatest retreat ever, the greatest worship experience ever, right? And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So here they are. They're walking down the hill, okay? And when they came to the disciples, that is the other disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Now, as we come into this story, I, I, I can't run past this. Like, have you ever had a time when you've been at a retreat or you've had just an awesome church worship service or you're like, man, that sermon was awesome. I just, fantastic. And then you get in the car and then somebody's on you. They start griping, why haven't you gotten this done? Or I can't believe you haven't done this. Or I can't believe you said this. Or you, you need to follow these, like, you've just been worshiping Jesus or you've been on a retreat or a camp or something like that. And it, I remember coming home from a summer camp one time, and I just had an incredible experience of my life, and I'm coming down from the mountain, literally, it was on a mountaintop camp. I'm coming down, and I get back to my house, and I just want to tell my mom and dad just how much Jesus has changed my life during the week, and I walk through, and my mom gives me a list of the 10 things that need to be done because I've been gone for the last week. And it's like, wah, wah, wah. like, well, somebody had to cut the grass. I mean, no one's cut it in a week. And it, it just, it was like downer. This will happen to you. This is how the devil can attack us. I mean, you're just following along, walking with the Lord. And then he gets you with just things of the world. And I'm not saying the people who tell you to do things that they're wrong. I'm just saying, man, you've had this experience, but then you've got to come back to real life. That's the world we live in. Where you're going tomorrow morning is real life. What we do when we come in here just prepares you for real life. We want this to be a good experience for you, but when you go back out, that's the real world. That's coming down from the mountain. So that's what we see here with the disciples. They're coming down, and now the other nine are fighting with what group of people? The rule followers, the scribes. The devil is after them. What are they arguing about? Okay, we'll see. Immediately, all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, they were greatly amazed. 
And they ran up to him and greeted him. Now, this word for greatly amazed is like they were in awe. It's kind of like you see a rock star and everybody's, woo! So the scribes and Pharisees and all the crowds are walk, watching the disciples, you know, Bartholomew and Philip, they're over here. And Andrew, they're arguing with the scribes, right? The teachers of the law about what Jesus teach versus what their Pharisees teach and their rabbis teach. And then everybody sees rock star Jesus coming. They're like, it's Jesus. This is the guy we were looking for. So they all just run over to him. And as they're running over there, Jesus yells out to his disciples. He says, what are, you, what are you arguing about with them? Like, why are you even talking to these scribes? You're, you're not going to gain anything from this. You know these men are wicked. Why are you even having a debate with them? What are you talking to them about? And then a man from the crowd answers, and he says, teacher. This is where, where we get the word rabbi. Rabbi, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation. This, whenever you see the O oh there, when you see it, it's like a sigh in their language, like, oh, okay. You ever, you ever do that? You have somebody in their family, whenever you do something, they, want, they just, oh. I mean, it's just, Jesus feels that way here. Oh, faithless generation. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And you see the frustration on Jesus' face. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. He says, you know what? I've been with you guys for two and a half years. I've only got six more months with you. If you haven't learned how to do this in the last two and a half years, how do I know you're going to do it in the next six months? I'm not going to be here. He's been telling them, like, I'm going to the cross. They're going to kill me this spring. And then he finally says, just bring the boy to me. I'm going to take care of this. You guys have messed us up. But here's something I want you to see or ask. Why did the disciples lose the power to cast out demons? Just six months ago, they could do it. Why did they lose the power to do it? Well, Jesus answers their question at the end of the chapter, okay? So I'm going to go right there to answer this question right away, and then we'll return, okay? Uh, here's what they asked. This is after Jesus performed the miracle, you know, like, spoiler alert, he's going to heal the little boy, okay? <laughs> All right? So after he heals the boy, he enters the house, and his disciples ask him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Okay? Now, if, if I go back, I'm going to go back, and some of you are in the medical industry, and some of you may have this problem within the family, but if you're observing someone who has seizures, they get thrown down, they're shaking, they're foaming at the mouth, and they're grinding their teeth, and they become rigid, what would you say their problem is? What are they having? They're having a seizure. They battle with what? Epilepsy, right? Here, here's what I want you to see, okay? Most of the people around are thinking that he's got some kind of physical ailment. Some are recognizing that this is demonic. How do you know the difference between the two? Like, this is what the first point I want you to see, and Jesus wanted his disciples to see. If all you are seeing is the natural then you will never see the supernatural. This is so true. Listen, from the understanding of science and research, if you start out with the presupposition that God does not exist, then you'll never be able to see God at work in a situation. See, where the medical industry may have seen a seizure, epilepsy, Jesus and even the boy's father had the spiritual understanding to see this is bigger than some kind of physical problem. This is spiritual warfare at work. So I will say it again, like, no matter what's going on in your life, we should always ask the question, even if there's something physically bad going on in our bodies. The book of James will talk this, about this as well. I'm going to talk about that tonight. Sometimes we have illnesses in our bodies because of sin in our lives. Sometimes we have illnesses in our body because we are being attacked 
by demons. Sometimes we just have physical ailments and it's not because of something we're doing wrong. But we should always ask the question, whenever something's going wrong, it doesn't matter in what area of our lives, is there demonic activity going on here? And if so, why? What's leading to that? But the big thing that we see hit the apostles here when they come to Jesus and they say, why couldn't we deal with this little boy? Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus says, it only comes out by prayer. It's another way of saying if you've stopped praying to God, then you've stopped trusting in God. If you've stopped praying to God, then you've stopped trusting in God. Follow me here. The little boy comes. He's possessed by a demon. The disciples can't cast the demon out. Jesus comes down. He casts the demon out, and they're just sitting there like losers. I can just see the people in the crowd look at the boys like, you bunch of losers, you can't do anything right. Jesus came and bailed you out, right? So Jesus gets them aside later, and they were like, why can't we do it? And Jesus said, well, you know what? You needed to pray. Now, how did this happen? How did not one out of nine disciples say, hey, guys, this isn't working so far. Maybe we should try this. Oh, I don't know. How about we pray and ask God for help? But this is what had happened to the disciples. Not one of the nine thought, let's stop and pray about this. Let's stop and demonstrate our dependence on God at this moment. This, this is at the heart of this story, okay? There, there's something blocking a miracle in their life. And it's the lack of trusting and depending on God. Let me, let me tell you what. There may be some area of your life, I'm not saying all, I'm just saying there may be some area of your life where God wants to do something supernatural in your life. He wants to take care of a relationship problem or a physical problem, but there's something blocking that miracle because you're not praying, you're not trusting, or you're not living in a godly way. This is why, like, no matter what, every time I get sick or something's just not going the way I want, I stop and I look in the mirror. And I say, is there anything about me that doesn't reflect the holiness of Christ that may be impeding God's ability to work through me? To work maybe even in spite of me? Always ask that question, no matter what's going on in your life, if, if there's some area that doesn't have peace in your life, always ask this question first. I'm not saying it's always the answer, but what I'm saying is it's the first place you go. If something in your family's not working the way it's supposed to, something at your job, something in your physical body, no matter what's going on, something's not going the way you believe God would have it go that lines up with the Scripture, the first thing I always ask is there's something the guy in the mirror is doing, some lack of holiness in my life that is keeping, that is blocking a miracle from God, a supernatural situation, the Holy Spirit from entering into this situation and fixing it Jesus' way. Always ask that question. And let me tell you what. My experience has been usually the answer is yes. The problem is in part with me. It's not all there, it's, a, it's me. I haven't depended on God, I haven't trusted in God. And I need to go to God and confess my sin. There's some habit, some area in my life Maybe I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, like praying. Or maybe there's something I shouldn't be doing, but I keep doing it. And God reveals that to me. Clean up your heart. So Jesus goes over to the little boy. He grabs him. He's praying with the father. And this is where we'll go back to where we left off, where Jesus says, bring the boy to me. Bring him here. And they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the spirit, that's the evil spirit, that's the demon, saw Jesus immediately convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And again, everybody watching, if you're in the medical industry, you've seen this. And you're like, it's epilepsy. We're like, somebody do something. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. Now, I'm going to ask a hard question here that a lot of times we just don't ask in church. Because it feels like we're disrespecting God by asking. 
But if you're the parent in this situation, you know that dad has prayed. There's a reason he brought the boy to Jesus is because the boy's been having these problems all these years. And so now Jesus speaks out to him and he's going to heal the little boy. But here's my question. Where was Jesus five years ago? This little boy's been suffering through this illness all this time. We, we read that he's deaf, he's mute, he takes these seizures, they throw him in the fire, they throw him into water, the devil's trying to, like, don't you know that little boy's mom has just been praying, Lord, heal my child, heal my child, heal my child, heal my child. God, why did you give me a child with these physical ailments, Lord? He, he's got something going on in his brain. It's been like, God, please, how many times do you know that dad and that mom have begged God to heal their child? If you've ever had a, a persistent or a chronic illness in your family, like everybody's saying, God, please show up. God, please show up. Jesus, please. Do it. They're looking in the mirror like, what did I do wrong? What, what can I do to fix this? Like, why is this little boy this way? Surely it's not God's will for him to be mute. Surely it's not God's will for him to be deaf. I'm going to take you back to the book of Exodus to answer this question. God calls Moses to go out and speak, and Moses is like, man, I'm a stutterer. I'm not very articulate. I don't need to be the one to go out and lead your people. And then the Lord says to Moses these words, and a lot of times we just ignore this in church. We like to believe something else is true about God than what he teaches us about himself. The Lord says to Moses, who has made a man's mouth. Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not the devil, says the Lord? Is that what this verse says? Who made this little boy to have convulsions? Who made him deaf? Who didn't give him the ability to speak? From the time he was a baby, it wasn't the devil. He wasn't ultimately the one in charge. Now, we see that the, a demon is involved here, but this is what God's teaching. I make blind people. A lot of times people will say, man, I can't believe God would, have, like, there must be sin. Like, Pentecostal people, like, that my grandma grew up in the church, like, if something's going wrong, it's because there must be sin. Like, you've done something wrong. And God says, you know what? In some situations, it is because someone's done something wrong. But more often than not, God made them that way. In certain regions of Scandinavia, they've said they've cured Down syndrome. You know how they've learned to cure Down syndrome? They kill babies with Down syndrome in the womb. And behind that philosophy is there's no way that God would want a child to be born who had downs. What's God teaching here? If a child is born with downs, who made them that way? It doesn't say who allowed them to be mute, who allowed them to be deaf, who allowed them to be dumb. That's not the word here. The word is who made them that way. This was God's will for this child to be in the situation he was in. God made them that way. Now come on, now, Jesus says the same thing in John chapter 9. Jesus passes by and he sees a man blind from birth. And disciples had this belief that a lot of times a lot of Pentecostals have. Like if somebody's sick, it's a result of some kind of sin. So the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Like somebody had to do something wrong in order for this person to be blind at this point in their life. Like who did something wrong? And Jesus answers, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now let that just soak in for a minute. It's a grown man, at least 18 years old. And for 18 years, he has suffered with blindness. 
and the parents have suffered with taking care of him, praying to God every day, Lord, what did we do wrong that he ended up like this? Or maybe he's thinking, man, what did I do to incur the wrath of God? Because that's what the Pharisees taught in that day. If you had sinned your life, you, somebody, either the parents or the kid, did something wrong. Because there's no way that God would ever create someone with some kind of physical ailment. It has to be a punishment. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's not a punishment. I made them that way. And for at least 18 years, this guy has suffered for bl from blindness. Why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, Jesus is saying, God made this man blind so that someday the glory of God could be known through his blindness. That's what's happening with this little boy. Jesus says, how long has he been this way? Like, didn't Jesus already know he'd been? Of course. He knew how long the little boy had been this way. He wants everybody else to hear how long this boy has been this way. It's not just some overnight problem. This is long term. God made him this way, and the way he made him this way is he allowed this demon to attack him to make him this way. We don't like to think about God making people with physical ailments. We don't like to think about God putting bad things into our lives. But listen, sometimes God does this for his glory. And listen, I'm getting real with you this morning. And again, most pastors don't even talk about this. But I have to because I'm working through the passage. I can't avoid it. I could have just skipped this story. If your number one priority in life, if you think the main reason that Jesus died on the cross was for human happiness, then this story will never make sense for you. If you think the purpose of the universe is to make human beings happy, then you're missing the point of this story. And you're going to miss the point of a lot of bad things that happen to you in your life. I would say a lot of times the things that happen in our life that are bad are not a result of our own sin or someone else's. But God made it that way so that his glory could be shown forth. No one sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Listen, some of the greatest testimonies of Jesus, almost all of the testimonies of Jesus' power in your lives have come as a result of suffering in your lives. You pray the most when you or a loved one suffers. You call out on the grace of God the most when you or a loved one is suffering. Remember what we said a few weeks ago? When Jesus calls you to follow him, he's not calling you to an easier life. He's calling you to a life of suffering for his name. Jesus Christ is most glorified when we suffer. You're like, Steve, man, what kind of God is this? It's a God whose priority is himself. Let me say it another way. God will not be a violator of his own first commandment. You shall have no other gods. I mean, there can be no other priorities than God. And for God, his number one priority is God. It's his glory. And so Jesus has allowed this little boy to go through all the suffering he has. Like, couldn't God in heaven have seen this little boy going through this demonic? Couldn't God have said, okay, demon, be gone? Couldn't God have done that 10 years before this? Couldn't God say when someone gets cancer, couldn't God say, you know what, cancer, be gone? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he just eradicate all disease on this earth? And we like to play it off and blame it on Adam or Eve. 
But when you have a God in heaven who has the ability to just speak the word and everyone's healed, ultimately he's the one responsible because he could do something, and yet he is choosing not to. Why? Because God is most glorified when his servants suffer for his name and yet respond in faith. So Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been happening to him? He says, from childhood, we'll continue. He says, and it often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. And then he says something that a lot of times we'll say to God, we just don't say it out loud. But Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This word for help is run to this emergency. It's, non, it's the Greek word for 911. I need your help. I need it right now. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can. And this is what catches Jesus' attention. And he says these words. If you can. If I can. You're saying to me, if I can. Like Jesus like, of course I can. And then he says these incredible words. All things are possible for one who believes. And immediately, the father who's been beaten down and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and and nothing ever changes. He, in a moment of brutal honesty, he cries out, he says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. 911 with my lack of faith. Same word as earlier. 911, help him with his physical ailment. But now he's realizing, watch, 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 watch. Up until this point, the problem has been needing help for the little boy. Up until this point, the prayer has been, my child needs physical healing. And then Jesus points out all things are possible for him who believes. And then the dad gets it. Here's what I need help with. This is what I need to call 911 about. It's not because of my little boy. The, the problem is, don't miss this. The problem is my lack of faith. This is where I need help. Watch. Jesus has brought this man to the position. Watch, watch, watch. He's brought him to the position to where he says, this isn't really about my little boy, is it? This has never been about your little boy. God allowed your child to go through this situation, dear sir, so that you will recognize that you need 911 help. So that you will recognize that you have a faith problem. And for the first time the guy gets it, he says, you know what? I believe in God. This is what we say, isn't it? I say, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Well, of course I do. He has power over the universe. Of course I do. And you don't believe that he's in control of your current circumstance? You don't believe that he's taking whatever things going on in your life right now and working it about to his glory? And this is where we say, man, I believe in God. But I have a hard time believing that God has let me go through this. What kind of God is this? And I'm going to tell you, here's the answer. He's a God who will bring glory to himself by bringing us to his glory. And until we can recognize that, a lot of times God's not going to fix it. But now that the man's got it, when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus. This is one of the greatest words in the English language. I got all this problem, but Jesus. 
whatever's going on in your life. You've got all this going on, but just remember, in faith, but Jesus took him by the hand, and he lifted him up, and he arose. And this is what I want to give to you this morning, my friends. Our God is the God of the impossible. But the first thing he has to do is build that faith in you. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, as we uh, close out this sermon right now, I just, uh, I don't want to come across like I'm insensitive or I don't care about what people are going through. I'm going through my own stuff. And a lot of times I just get distracted. My faith gets troubled. I believe, but I need you to help me in my unbelief. I believe, but I don't believe fully. I trust, but I don't completely trust. I know you're the answer, but still I have questions. So I pray right now for everyone in this room. I, I just want to say this right up front, that maybe something's going on in their life that has nothing to do with sin. It's not anybody's fault. It's just you allowed this to happen. You made it to happen. Ultimately, you're going to get glory through this. And it may not end in physical healing. But it will end in glory to your name. Lord, help us to trust you even when things aren't going our way. Help us to keep on believing even though we've prayed for years about a certain situation. Yes, we need to first look in the mirror to see if there be any wicked way in us that's causing this ailment or situation in our lives. But once we've confessed that to you, Lord Jesus, the next question we need to be asking is, Lord, how are you going to bring yourself glory out of my situation? How are you going to bring yourself glory out of my broken marriage? How are you going to bring glory out of this physical ailment that my family member is suffering? And Lord, we may not have that answer right now, but help us believe in your glory. Lord, I break our will so that we're not praying for what we want but we're praying for what you want which is more glory so father it scares me to pray this prayer and forgive me for my lack of faith in saying even that but I'll just say it right now Lord this is my prayer, and for everyone in here who can pray this in faith with me. Whatever brings you glory, let it be so. I pray this in Christ's name.